Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. And first, I would like to thank Joseph and Mario for giving me the opportunity to start with this overview of HIV reservoirs and sanctuary sites. After 15 years of successes with antiretroviral therapy, we definitely need new strategies because art is not the ultimate answer to the pandemic. Lifelong heart goes with problems of compliance, resistance, toxicity, access and cost, but above all it's unable to cure HIV infection. And when we fight an infectious disease, we both need a vaccine for those who are not yet infected and a cure for those who are chronically infected. However, we have achieved already great progress and define a constellation of strategy that can eventually lead to an HIV cure. Some of them act on T-cell survival, others on T-cell homeostatic proliferation, on myeloid T-cell interactions, while others try to make cells resistant to HIV. But all these new approaches need to take into consideration the two concepts of HIV reservoirs and sanctuary sites, which show some differences but are closely linked. During this presentation, I would like to discuss with you three old questions and three new ones that, in my mind, are of particular importance in this context of the search of a cure. The first old question is about ongoing viral replication during effective art. The answer is repeatedly no for researchers using mathematical formulas and yes for those analyzing real cases of patients. In particular, studies of episomal viral DNA, either in the context of oral tegravir intensification or just before plasma viremia rebound, have provided proof for persistent ongoing replication, at least in a subset of patients. This is important for the maintenance of the reservoir, but also to define the best combinations able to protect uninfected cells when testing anti-latency agents. This issue is even more relevant today in the light of recent data showing that although antiretrovirals are very effective at blocking infection from cell-free virus, they are quite ineffective at blocking cell-to-cell -cell viral transfer. The second question is about the existence of other important cellular reservoirs and CD4 positive T cells. If they are considered to be a minor problem quantitatively, they represent qualitatively a major obstacle for the eradication of HIV, in particular regarding macrophages and hematopoietic progenitor cells. The third old question is about the clinical correlates of the concept of HIV reservoirs and sanctuary sites. According to official guidelines, therapeutic success is the same if you use drugs reaching the CNS or not. However, clinical observations show that the prevalence of neurocognitive disorders remains high in the art era and that HIV encephalitis can occur in patients despite plasma viral suppression. Consequently, we have to better assess what's going on beyond the blood compartment. The first new challenge is to define better virological tools and new endpoints to use in eradication trials. Obviously, all our current virological tests lack the dynamic range needed to document HIV eradication. We also need to define and standardize tests to assess other body fluids and blood and to sample some tissue reservoirs. 
considering the limits of our current virologic essays, we will probably have to include art cessation as final readout in these eradication trials. The second question is about the existence of a threshold below which we could drive the reservoir down, allowing a sustained control of viral replication without continuing art. This case, reported by Tewuk Chen, shows that even the patient with the lowest level of the reservoir ever measured undetectable proviral DNA in PBMCs and in colon cells, only one infected cell per 1.7 billion CD4s, this patient experienced viremia rebound 50 days after stopping heart. Because if one of the few remaining cells are sufficient to rekindle infection, we will need very strong strategies to pierce the reservoirs, or we will need to systematically combine them with an immune control of residual HIV disease. The final question is about the risks of these strategies and the ethical issues they are raising. There is, at least in theory, a risk of brain damage with HDAC inhibitors and an oncologic risk both with HDAC inhibitors by reactivating ancestral retroviral sequences and with thin finger nucleases by off-target mutations. We also have to find a cure that is scalable and not restricted to high-tech laboratories or rich countries. To conclude, we are currently inventing the future of our fight against HIV and AIDS, and a cure is definitely the big challenge of the next decade. It's our mission to bring our patients there safely and allow science and innovation to give their best for this cause.